I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, questions and concerns. How lawmakers are responding to President Joe Biden's mishandling of classified documents. Saying goodbye. A report from Rome on the funeral of Australian Cardinal George Pell. Targeting the faithful. New developments in Sunday's terror attack on a Pentecostal church in the Congo. And a pet project. Why the faithful in Spain are bringing animals to honor the feast of St. Anthony of the Desert. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Anthony of the Desert. Our top story tonight, searches that uncovered classified documents at President Joe Biden's Delaware home and former office remain the topic of intense scrutiny, prompting questions such as who may have had access to the classified material and how did the records get there in the first place? White House correspondent Owen Jensen begins our team coverage tonight. As a special counsel reviews the matter today in the White House press briefing room, reporters demanded more details. Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre fielding more questions on the mishandled classified documents. Guys, you guys can ask me this 100 times, 200 times if you wish. I'm going to keep saying the same thing. I hear your question. It's been asked. It's been answered. It's been noted. And we're just going to try to move on here. The Trump campaign was quick to criticize the president, writing, Biden's mishandling of classified documents finally has many of his allies in the press admitting what has been obvious to us all. Biden is incompetent and puts our national security at risk. Meanwhile, President Biden welcomes to the White House Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte. So today I look forward to discussing uh, how we can further deepen our relationship and securing our supply chains to strengthen our transatlantic partnership. One topic, China. The U.S. looking to persuade the Netherlands to further limit China's access to advanced semiconductors with export restrictions. As for taking questions, no luck. Sir, why didn't you tell us? Also on the agenda, the ongoing war in Ukraine. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Army General Mark Milley, visited Germany, where U.S. troops are training Ukrainian forces. The trip follows a barrage of Russian airstrikes over the weekend. The death toll in one apartment building rose above 40. Western analysts believe the Kremlin is digging in for a drawn-out war. And on a much lighter note, crowning a champion. The NBA best Golden State Warriors honored at the White House today for their 2022 championship season. While Golden State is celebrating a basketball championship, the state of California is suffering from a barrage of storms since late last month, dumping heavy rain and snow, cutting power, swamping roads, washouts, flooding, landslides. And on Thursday, President Biden will travel to California to visit areas impacted. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Following the recent discovery of even more classified documents from President Joe Biden, Republicans are now launching multiple investigations. Several are also demanding the White House turn over the visitor logs to the residents and any other information that may shed more light on the situation. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales continues our team coverage tonight. Eric? Well, good evening, Tracy. No, Congressman James Comer, chair of the Oversight Committee, tells me that he has a lot of questions. He wants to see the documents and communications related to the searches by the Biden team. He's also concerned about a double standard in the way that President Biden is being treated and the way that President Trump was treated last year during the raid at his Mar-a-Lago home. He knew very well that he himself had possession of classified documents. So the hypocrisy here is great. We're very concerned about a lack of transparency. We're very concerned, as I've said many times, about a two-tier system of justice in America. And we just want equal treatment. And hopefully we'll get some answers very soon. In a letter Sunday to the White House Chief of Staff, Congressman James Comer criticized the searches by Biden representatives and called the Wilmington, Delaware home a crime scene. He said Biden's, quote, mishandling of classified materials raises the issue of whether he has jeopardized our national security and demands all records, including visitor logs, be handed over by the end of the month. I think we want to collect more of the data, more of the information. Are these all the documents? Are there more out there? I mean, um, I know the White House tried to say it was all cleared up on Thursday, and now that we find there's more documents, I think there's a lot of questions that uh, continue to raise, and we want to get all the information possible. 
we want to know what precipitated the hiring of the special counsel and, and all of the information surrounding this. We just don't know yet. We'll be making those determinations going forward. I think this will be a big priority for our select committee on the weaponization of the federal government and also oversight and judiciary as well. So we'll be very busy with this. Top Democrats on the House Oversight Committee say they have confidence in the appointed special counsels for President Biden and former President Donald Trump. So when my friend Mr. Comer says we're just looking for equal treatment, that's all we're looking for. I think it's good that this is in the hands of special counsels on both sides. And the special counsels, you know, are both uh, trustworthy lawyers who I think will get to the bottom of it. The White House says President Biden did not keep any visitors' logs for his Delaware home where some of the documents were found. Now Republicans are preparing to take action as soon as next week when they come back to Congress. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, joining us tonight is Jessica Anderson, Executive Director of Heritage Action. Jessica, great to see you again. Uh, let's get right to it. It seems every time we think we've seen the end of it, uh, there are more classified documents that just keep on popping up. Your thoughts and concerns about all of this. Good evening, Tracy. It's, it's great to be with you as well. You know, I think the first question that this Congress actually needs to ask is, at what point did the Department of Justice become um, it was it made known to them that these classified documents were in Biden's garage? Was it before the midterms election? Was it after? And what is that gap from when the American people were actually made aware? That is the, the timeline, something that, that I think the new oversight chairman, Chairman Comer, can, can look into and really try to understand. The second question it, it gets to what your earlier guests were talking about is, the American people desire that the DOJ, the FBI, Biden's White House, that they not politicize law enforcement against the American people. Are we seeing that again with how they're handling Biden's classified documents in this case? Yeah, and Jessica, I also want to talk about the White House and its reaction so far. They say they're fully cooperated and they're committed to transparency on this matter. But do you think they are being transparent? I mean, it seems there are a lot of reporters asking a lot of questions, but not really getting any answers. Well, you would certainly know that the White House was being transparent if they were actually able to answer the questions on the press stump at the daily briefing. As we saw earlier today, that was not the case. The press secretary was effusive in refusing to answer many reporters' questions about the timeline, the handling of the documents. Are there any more? What, what actually prompted the search in the first place? And then what now is the role of the White House going to be with the Republican-led oversight committee? Is it going to be one of support and cooperation? or are they going to hide the ball and hide things at the DOJ? I think those are the types of questions that the American people are demanding that we know. It's very simple. Is the president following the law, yes or no? Yeah, and also the timing of all this. It's really interesting, right? Just last week, there was a lot of talk of President Biden announcing plans for a 2024 run. Where do you think things stand right now? I mean, do you think he and his team are reassessing? Do you think the Democrats want him to run at this point? And do you think he's a liability? Well, I think any time that you have a situation like this happen, playing out behind closed doors, it actually forces the American people to think twice about who their highest leader of the land is. Can they actually trust the president of the United States to follow the law and to actually abide by the laws that are around such sensitive things as our national security and our homeland security? When those things are not being done, Tracy, I think that's when you have the American people really question the legitimacy of this president. And so if I was advising the Biden team, I would be thinking twice about a 2024 run. I would also be thinking about ways to make sure that my own house is in order before I hit that campaign trail and started poking holes in Republicans across the aisle. I want to switch gears now, Jessica. We're just days away from the March for Life. And now that we're living in a post-Row country, I'm wondering what more work you think needs to be done on the pro-life front and where do we go from here? That's a great question, Tracy, and I think all pro-life Americans this week in particular are thrilled that we can come to Washington, D.C., and we can march in the streets in an act of celebration. But the work to protect life is actually far from over, and we're going to see this play out both in state legislative cycles all across the country as state legislatures begin to take up really important um, pro-life legislation like the Heartbeat Bill, Life at Conception, Patient uh, Conscious Protection Acts, all of these bills in state chambers. And then federally, the new Republican-led House is off to a great start. They've already passed 
the Born Alive Infant Survivors Protection Act. It passed last week. I expect this to be one of many pro-life federal pieces of legislation that this new Congress is going to have to grapple with and the House is hopefully going to pass, including defunding Planned Parenthood and hopefully a heartbeat bill as well. So much more to come on the, on the life front. And this week's celebration is just step one. And Jessica, we have probably a, a little less than a minute left or so, but quickly, what else are you following? Well, I also think as all of these state legislative um, sessions open across the country, keep an eye out for those gender affirming bills that state legislators are popping up. Keep an eye out at, at also pro family legislation that's moving through chambers in Florida and Georgia and other places across the country. It's going to be a big year for all of us that want to put faith fam and family first and certainly all of us pro-lifers across America. And Jessica, always great to get your insights and to be with you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Well, the head of the U.S. Bishops Conference was among those paying tribute yesterday to the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. In a statement, Archbishop Timothy Brolio said in part, quote, remembering that Dr. King was guided first by his faith also challenges us to personal conversion. Unjust structures exist because personal sin persist. Yesterday was the U.S. federal holiday honoring the Baptist minister and civil rights icon. He was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. Dr. Martin Luther King would have been 94 years old. Well, the British government says that it will block a law designed to make it easier for people in Scotland to legally change their gender. Officials in Glasgow plan to appeal the decision to the UK Supreme Court. Scotland's Catholic bishops have spoken out strongly against the loosening of gender identity. A Catholic priest was burned to death after bandits set fire to his parish rectory Sunday in northern Nigeria. The body of Father Isaac of Saints Peter and Paul Catholic Church was found among the wreckage. Another priest in the rectory escaped. He was later shot and is now being treated for gunshot wounds. The Archbishop of Lima celebrated mass in honor of the lives lost during the country's recent bloody protests. Archbishop Carlos Castillo knelt in front of the pictures of the deceased, praying for each of their souls. At least 49 people have died in the violence that began when the president was ousted. In Peru, Archbishop Castillo urged the faithful to find peace between both sides of the conflict. Thousands of people in Venezuela feel the streets demanding better working conditions and wages in the socialist country. Protesters tried to rally outside of government buildings but were blocked by police. Protests are in response to high inflation with millions of people living in poverty. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including Vatican Funeral, a report from Rome on the service honoring Cardinal George Pell, plus new developments in the deadly attack attack on a Pentecostal church in the Congo. Thanks for staying with us. Pope Francis says that he is praying for the victims of Sunday's terror attack in eastern Congo. At least 14 people died after their Pentecostal church was attacked. Islamic militants are claiming responsibility. The Holy Father is set to travel to the Central African nation later this month. The Holy Father also is offering his condolences to those affected by the deadly plane crash in Nepal. At least 69 people died in Sunday's tragedy. The plane crashed as it attempted to land in a newly opened airport. Among those on board were people from India, Russia, South Korea, France, Ireland, and Australia. Now, several church leaders, including the Holy Father, attended Saturday's funeral mass for Cardinal George Pell. A large crowd, including several of the Cardinal's family members from Australia, attended the service inside of St. Peter's Basilica. In his homily, Cardinal Giovanni Battista Rey called Cardinal Pell a man of God and a man of the church who was deeply concerned by the weakening of faith in the world. Cardinal Pell died last week following hip surgery. He was 81 years old. Joining us now from Rome is Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Andreas, great to see you as always. Uh, can you tell us about the funeral on Saturday? 
Sure. So the funeral mass of Cardinal Pell took place last Saturday here in Rome. It was a solemn celebration, I can say, and hundreds of mourners participated in this mass at the altar of the chair in St. Peter's Basilica. The mourners were in, uh, included the Australian ambassador to the Holy See, Chiara Poro, many members of the Roman Curia, and the Cardinal's family. Cardinal Ray, who is the dean of the College of Cardinals, presided over the Mass. Pope Francis later then also attended and performed the rite of final commendation for the former Archbishop of what was first Melbourne, and then he was the Archbishop of Sydney. In his homily, Cardinal Ray remembered Pell as a man of God and a man of the Church. He also said that the outspoken prelate had a strong character that at times could appear harsh. And this suggestion could be attributed to the fact that Cardinal George Bell was not afraid to openly address things, as we know. This was also, Tracy, part of other news around his funeral this weekend. The English weekly The Spectator published posthumously a commentary by Bell about the current situation of the Church, in which the Australian prelate openly criticized the current synod of synodality. Also this weekend, the Italian Vaticanista Sandro Magista revealed that an anonymous so-called memorandum circling the Roman Curia for quite a while now can be assigned to Bell. In this article, the author heavily criticizes the certain aspects of the current pontificate. And what more do we know about Cardinal Pell's article? What can you tell us? So, the commentary he wrote for The Spectator was published posthumously, but I would like to explain that it was actually not intended that way. Um, the editors of The Weekly made sure also to mention that Cardinal Pell intended this piece to be published around this time, and everyone, including the Cardinal himself, obviously were taken by surprise and the sudden, sudden passing of the Cardinal. This means that he was prepared to face the consequences of his criticism as well. Now, Cardinal Pell focused in this piece on the Synod of Synodality, and he called it, and I quote, a toxic nightmare. The working document that the Synod presented last year as the result of a global consulting of a global listening phase, he titled to be one of the most incoherent documents ever sent out from Rome. In particular, he mentioned that because of differences of opinion on abortion, contraception, the ordination of women to the priesthood, and homosexual activity, some felt that no definitive positions on these issues, and I quote again, can be established or proposed. This is also true of other issues such as polygamy, divorce, and remarriage. Now, Cardinal Pell called the document being hostile to the apostolic tradition. And he also mentioned the related general of the Synod, which of course is Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich by name, writing that he has publicly rejected the basic teachings of the Church on sexuality on the grounds that they contradict modern science. And Andreas, quickly, before I let you go, um, have there been, has there been any response uh, from Vatican officials to this article? So we have not seen or also not received any reactions to that. Of course, we, we are in contact. We've reached also out before before this was published uh, to, the, to the Senate of Bishops uh, to understand a little bit how uh, Cardinal Pell's statements are being received. And, uh, but in general, we can say that Cardinal Pell's statements reflect a widely shared concern that the global Senate, a little bit like the German synodal path, is being hijacked by someone uh, or, or by some to promote their ideological agenda. Of course, we should remember also Cardinal Gregg's words, and he's the prelate responsible for the synodal process, that the only one, he said, who will be allowed to hijack the synod is the Holy Spirit. All right. Well, thank you so much, Andreas. We appreciate it, as always. Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, an aggressive approach, a closer look at the troubling new guidelines from one U.S. organization fighting childhood obesity. Plus cause and effect. Why dogs and cats were allowed inside of a church in Spain. Welcome back. Some new treatment guidelines for the more than 14 million obese children and teens in the United States. The American Academy of Pediatrics now recommends aggressive therapies like pills and surgery early on as long-term remedies for weight loss. A new guideline moves away from watchful waiting or delayed treatment to see if kids outgrow obesity. Ben joining us tonight with his reaction to this move is Tristan Justice, author and staff writer 
at The Federalist. Tristan, great to see you. Uh, first off, your thoughts on these new guidelines. Well, we're really teaching children the wrong message, and we keep treating symptoms as opposed to the disease, the disease itself. And so, look, over the last 100 years, Big Pharma has really grown addicted to uh, treating symptoms and treating uh, uh, symptoms of disease as opposed to curing or even preventing disease, since that makes far less far less money than uh, for big food and big pharma. And so we're teaching kids they can continue to eat however they want and live however they want and, and, and not exercise and just take a magic pill or get a magic surgery uh, to cure their obesity. And, and so it's the exact wrong message, especially when we have a country where one in five children are categor categorically obese. Yeah, and the guidelines urge uh, early treatment options at the highest available intensity. Uh, that is pretty strong language and really aggressive, I think. What does this suggest to you uh, about the gravity of the situation regarding kids and obesity in the United States? And let's also talk about some of the health risks th that do come hand in hand with obesity. Well, it does signal that more people in this country are really starting to take this issue seriously. I mean, uh, children obviously take the, the habits of their parents, and we have a population where if you are at a metabolically healthy weight, you're in the minority. Uh, about 70% 70, 70 of the population is overweight, at least more than 42% of the population is categorically obese. And so it's really no surprise that 20% of those aged 2 to 19 are obese, uh, and especially the lockdowns really exacerbated these trends. Uh, the, the rate of type 2 diabetes doubled for children. Uh, the rate of uh, BMIs uh, doubled for children over the lockdown. Downs. And so uh, what we've done is we've created an entire generation of metabolically unhealthy people and, and, and everybody's uh, just getting sick. Uh, we have a toxic food supply and, uh, and the, the end result is a generation of, of obese individuals who aren't living up to their full potential. And so what we're doing is we're medicating all the symptoms of obesity, but we're not dealing with the core issue. And these medications carry themselves uh, with their own side effects from, from nausea, in, in some cases extreme vomiting and extreme fatigue um, uh, to rid these people of obesity. And of course, you, you give a 13-year-old bariatric surgery, uh, you're creating a lifelong medical patient. And so big pharma profits and the individual still suffers as a result. Yeah. And many times, I, well, I shouldn't say many times, but oftentimes children do grow out of things. You know, as they get older, I've seen it in my own family, they kind of thin out with diet and exercise. Uh, but of course, as you mentioned, there are also contributing factors like screen time and also being on um, their other devices all the time. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about that and also psychological issues that really weren't mentioned either when it comes to, to being overweight and obese. Absolutely. You know, the issue is not actually that as complicated as people make it sound. I, I think that the country just needs to go back to basics and, and, and take kids, uh, get them off their phones and throw them outside, get them active and get them eating healthy, uh, get them eating whole foods. Uh, parents should shop on the outskirts of grocery stores and not in what a lot of people call the fun aisles with, with uh, you know, Oreos and all these processed foods. Walk down the cereal aisle at Walmart and, and try to pick out a healthy cereal. It's just amazing what we're advertising to children. And of course, they the, the store is really smart about this. They uh, they tend to uh, show the sugary cereals at, at, at the eye, eye length for children, and so the children then bug their parents to buy it for them. So, uh, no, what we need to do is just go back to basics, get the kids off their phones, and put them outside. It helps them be social, and it gets them active in, into the healthy lifestyle that then they'll carry with them for a lifetime. Yeah, Tristan, I want to bring something else up. I mean, you mentioned about the health risks when it comes to the surgeries and also the pills that go along um, with this. Doctors, part of the Hippocratic Oath is to do no harm. And you mentioned some of the things that may go along with the adverse effects. Can you talk to us about that and why they're pushing this? Well, I think a lot of doctors think they're doing no harm. I think a lot of doctors think they're actually doing the right thing, but the doctors have also been trained uh, by big pharma, uh, by the people in the big food industry. And of course, they're all in cahoots with, with big government. And so I, I think a lot of doctors have been misled and they continue to go down this rabbit hole of uh, prescribing medications that really uh, just treat the symptoms of de disease and really rarely never ever does the disease itself. And because, I mean, treating a disease uh, makes big pharma a lot more money than actually curing disease. And so I, I think doctors I think they're coming with good intentions, uh, but I think the end result is is really uh, contrary to the Hippocratic Oath. Just a few seconds left. Uh, really quickly, final thoughts. Well, I think this country just needs to go back to basic. Eat whole foods, eat, he uh, eat whole healthy foods, and get outside and be active. Great. Tristan, thank you so much for your insights. Appreciate it. Great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Well, finally tonight, Spanish cats and dogs gather under one roof to attend a special mass with their owners.
Well, the faithful brought their furry friends to be blessed on this feast of St. Anthony of the Desert. He is Spain's patron saint of animals. Pets are sprinkled with holy water to ensure their safety and protection. The festival in Madrid began in the 1980s. Adorable. We thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.